From the headquarters of Telesan English in Quito, Ecuador, I am Estefania Bravo. This is From the South. The government of Venezuela has announced that it has fully restored electricity across the country. Communications Minister Jorge Rodriguez said the government has overcome cyber and sabotage attacks on its power system, which began on Thursday. He added that potable water service has also been restored to 80% of the country. Work will resume on Thursday, while the suspension of classes will be extended for another 24 hours. Decimos. We want to say that the electricity service has been completely restored in the country. There are still minor problems in places where shifters were sabotaged. We are working to restore the service in the next hours in those areas. The President Nicolás Maduro has announced that Thursday will be a normal working day, including the private and public sectors, businesses, industries, and the service sector. The school activities will remain canceled for 24 hours more. Los renglones, público, privado, la... With the electricity restored in almost all of Venezuela, communi community organizations are working to restore basic services and to make sure food is available for everyone. The programs that have been providing the most help are the local committees for supplies and production, also known as CLAPS. Let's take a look. In this neighborhood, high in the hills of Caracas, people are waiting for the arrival of a truck full of food for the community. They're expectant but calm, thanks to their long tradition of community organizing. Such organization has been put to the test in recent days with the massive power outage caused by an attack on Venezuela's power grid. The latest sabotage was really bad. We have senior citizens here, but thankfully the Bolivarian government gave us a straight answer. There have been ups and downs, but the issue is being resolved and we continue moving forward. Families are organizing as part of the local committees for supplies and production, also known as CLAPS. They were created three years ago during a state of emergency to face the economic war waged against Venezuela. The CLAPs provide us with basic goods, flour, rice, sugar, grains, oil, pasta, canned tuna. This allows us to go on and keep food on our table. In this warehouse, 35,000 clap boxes arrive daily. From here, they go to 19 of the 24 parishes in Caracas every two weeks. 300,000 families receive their clap box, regardless of whether they support the government or the opposition. The CLAP came together thanks to social organizing, and they were formed to fight the economic war. Thanks to the CLAPs, we have created an efficient distribution system. They help us fight speculation and smuggling. We have managed to move our economy forward by overcoming the economic war. Communities are involved in every part of this process. We are guaranteeing food for my community. We are doing fine, thanks to my commander. People have raised their own consciousness in order to withstand the onset of those who want to see the Bolivarian revolution crumble. The quality of our work has only improved, as has the cooperation between Venezuelans. Following the attack on the country's power grid, the authorities have redoubled efforts to distribute clap boxes. Due to the emergency circumstances, 170,000 boxes will be distributed, of which 95% are financed by the government. A few will want to take this happiness away from us, but they will fail, because we are a country of love, of solidarity. We stand together against the war they are desperate for. What they don't know is that we are a conscientious people. Our eyes are open, thanks to Chavez. He opened our eyes. They haven't succeeded yet, and will continue to fail. This dense social tapestry that makes up so much of Venezuelan society remains invisible to the mainstream and corporate media. And Venezuelan citizens continue to show their support for the Bolivarian government. Hundreds of people attended an event in Caracas with concerts and political debates. Despite the attacks and the difficult circumstances, Chavista supporters are keeping their spirits high.
Grenada is commemorating the 40th anniversary of its successful unarmed revolution that overthrew the U.S.-backed Union Labor Party. On March 13, 1979, the New Jewish Movement, led by Maurice Bishop, staged a nearly bloodless coup. Bishop, a lawyer by profession, was then installed as Prime Minister of a new, newly established People's Revolutionary Government. In his first speech as PM, Bishop said to the people of Grenada, this revolution is for work, food, decent housing, and health services, and for a bright future for our children and great-grandchildren. Earlier, we were joined by the head of the Grenada Revolution Committee, Ruggles Ferguson. He told us about the lasting impact the revolution has had on all facets of society. Uh, the revolution described as the big revolution in a small country imploded in October 1983. Um, it came to power, the PRG came to power on March 13, 1979, 40 years ago. And in the four and a half years of revolution, that very short space of time, the uh, revolution has been able to impact significantly in all spheres of society, um, infrastructure development. In fact, the single largest economic project was undertaken, um, even single largest up to today. That's the construction of the international airport. Uh, we have had uh, um, the Center for Popular Education. That is the literacy program that designed to ensure that each and every single Grenadian, irrespective of age, was able to read and write. You had housing programs. You had the establishment of institutions like the Marketing National and Important Board. Uh, for farmers, uh, marketing of farmers' produce. You had the development of agro-industries. For the first time, Grenada started to export um, nectars, mango nectar, tamarind nectar, guava nectar, and a range of agro-industrial products. And the revolution, there was an explosion in education. Um, in the first year of the revolution, there were 109 scholarships awarded as opposed to three the previous year. You also had the establishment of the National Insurance Scheme, which survives up to today. So the revolution has impacted um, on uh, almost all facets of Grenadian society. Let's head over to Nigeria, where at least 10 people have died and 40 people have been rescued after a building housing a school collapse in Lagos Island. Frantic rescue efforts are still underway. Dozens of children are among the trapped. About 100 students were in the three-story building when it came down. The governor of Lagos, who visited the scene, says the school was operating illegally. He blamed the landlord for resisting the government's demolition plan. We can only talk about the number of people that we have rescued, which is in the excess of 40, and then we are still rescuing more. For more on this, we spoke to journalist Deji Badmus in Lagos to find out more about the situation. Well, people have been helping. To be candid, I, I must tell you that the rescue situation is a bit chaotic. Uh, chaotic in the sense that a crowd control at the scene is quite uh, very poor. Uh, too many people living around. That place is actually densely populated. Uh, and so uh, most of the rescue is done by the first responders, people around the area who are actually helping uh, the official rescue uh, agencies. But the, the whole process is not well coordinated at all. In any case, uh, people have been brought up. But to be candid, it's, um, it's a bit chaotic and not organized. The area is densely populated, quite difficult to move in heavy duty rescue equipment there. It, it took a lot of time, for instance, to move in one of the heavy duty uh, rescue equipment to, to the site. And um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really a problem. It, it's a problem and um, it, it's, it's actually nothing new because that, that area, that area of the city is prone to incidents like this. As a matter of fact, I would say 90% of the building collapse we've had in this city is actually around that area. And, um, and people are wondering why the authorities has actually not done much about that, the, the situation there. The fact is, from, from what we're gathering, that building uh, was actually bad. It was marked for demolition. 
uh, we understand the authorities had actually, that's the building control agency in the city, had marked the building for demolition. Now, why they did not demolish the building is, is what no one knows. And why people were still making use of the building after it had been marked for uh, demolition is, uh, is very difficult to tell. But, but it's actually common. It's common to have um, a, a situation like that where you would have buildings marked for demolition, but the demolition would not be carried out, and then you still have people use the building. So, um, At least 10 people are dead after two gunmen opened fire inside a school in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Among them are five students, two school officials, and the two attackers who committed suicide. At least another 17 were injured. The attack reportedly happened during break time at the Professor Raul Brazil State School in Susan. The motive is still unknown, but this comes two months after far-right President Jair Bolsonaro loosened gun control laws. There are two coordinators of that school and two attackers who committed suicide. First of all, to the victims, to the parents of those young people, to the relatives of those two female employees of the school, and also to the parents and relatives of the murderers, our solidarity. This was the saddest thing I have tended to in my whole life. I'm very sad that an event such as this one happened in our country and here in Sao Paulo. We stayed locked in a room. Many students were not feeling well, including me. We were all helping each other. And then they opened the door. We thought it was bandits that were coming to get us. But in fact, it was the police who told us to leave running, and we ran. Our correspondent in Brazil, Brian Muir, has more. On March 13th, two former students of a public school in Suzano, which is an industrial suburb located about 50 kilometers from Sao Paulo, returned to their former place of learning with guns. They opened fire, they killed five students, injured six other students, killed two school officials and a businessman who was on the premises at the time of the tragedy. Then they killed themselves. And this has left their neighbors and their family members stupefied because according to them, they had given no signs that they would ever do something like this. They were regular kids, they liked to play video games, they didn't use drugs. And it reminds people of the travesty that happened in Hialengo in Rio de Janeiro a few years ago when a similar incident left 10 children dead, and also of the kinds of school shootings that have become unfortunately popular in the United States, which is a country which has very liberal gun ownership laws. Now the president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, recently issued a decree liberalizing gun ownership in Brazil. So a big question right now is how is liberal gun ownership laws going to affect these kinds of shootings in Brazil? Thank you, Brian, for that. Let's take a short break now. Welcome back. Colombians have rallied in Bogota to demand the peace agreement with the FARC be respected. Demonstrators have rejected President Ivan Duque's willingness to change the agreements. The negotiators of the accord had previously warned the UN that the government could seriously damage the accord. On Sunday, Duque objected to six articles of the statutory law for the special jurisdiction for peace, a key mechanism to judge the crimes of the internal conflict. And Cuba's Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez has tweeted his reaction to the 43rd Annual Report on Human Rights Practices released by the U.S. State Department. He said that the United States has no moral authority to speak about human rights. He described the U.S. as a global repressor which discriminates against minorities, impoverishes the poor, and violates the rights of immigrants, among other violations. Activists in Brazil have staged a demonstration to demand justice for a murdered counselor, Mariel Franco, and her driver. Two barefoot women wiped the mock blood-stained ground in front of a cage to call for complete transparency in the case. Two former police officers were arrested in connection with the murder. Franco was an outspoken critic of the police and military militias. The objective is to demand the complete transparency of the murder of the Velaria Marial from the public power. We understand that there are people with a lot of power behind that crime. 
in addition to executives. We want to know who the intellectual actors of that murder were. 11,000 uh, people have been evacuated from BBVA's Mexico City's offices after a bomb threat. Police sent in a team of bomb experts to the offices of the Spanish bank. Located at one of the capital's tallest skyscrapers, the Torre Bancomer. The city's emergency services chief said both emails and phone calls warned of a possible explosive device in the building. BBVA said in a statement it did not believe the threats were real. Labor unions plan to intensify protest action after IMF approved a $4.2 billion, billion, million, billion dollar loan to support Ecuador for the next three years. Our correspondent, Denise Herrera, is in Quito with the details. The agreement arrived under the IMF's extended fund facility would also provide support for the government's austerity program. Ecuador's finance minister Richard Martinez has described this new agreement as fruitful cooperation. He has assured that it will protect social spending and the well-being of the most vulnerable. This will also restore investors' confidence in the country. It will allow local and international interests to expand their investments. And we're confident this will boost competitiveness and job creation. A pause on IMF Director Christine Lagarde's Twitter account stated that the agreement will support the government's effort to shore up its finances, including Ecuador's agenda to modernize the economy and create jobs while countering a corruption. The program is expected to pave the way for strong and equitable growth, but do social justice organizations share this view? The International Monetary Fund usually does this type of negotiation in secret. The question here is how legitimate is it? Because we have followed the strategies outlined by an international institution while failing to consider Ecuador's own governance structure and constitutional framework. Nearly 10,000 public officials were fired by the Ecuadorian government between February 27th and March 1st. Labor unions and the workers they represent have called this IMF deal a recipe for disaster. They are vowing to intensify protest action until President Moreno shows respect workers' rights. Denise Herrera, Telesur, Ecuador. The first thermal solar plant in Latin America is being built in Chile. The plant allows to produce electricity all day long, unlike other forms of renewable energy, and it consists of a 250-meter tower surrounded by thousands of giant mirrors. The project aims at helping the country achieve its goal of using only sustainable energy by 2040. We're capable of stocking this heat to generate electricity with a turbine as we need it during the day, during the night, or at any time if it's cloudy, or if the solar production is lower for any reason. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. Aircraft manufacturer Boeing has announced that it is grounding its entire fleet of the 737 MAX 8 and 9, spending investigations into the Ethiopian Airlines. A statement by the company said the decision was made out of an abundance of caution and the need to address the public's concerns about the safety of the aircraft. The decision comes after a deadly airplane crash in Ethiopia that killed 157 people, the second accident of this jet since October. Meanwhile, hundreds of travelers in the U.S. have been left stranded following the decision to ground all Boeing 737 MAX jets. Airlines have, however, assured that all passengers that were booked on the 737 MAX aircraft will be transferred to other flights. Earlier on, during a media briefing, President Trump said planes in the air could fly to their destinations. The announcement comes less than a day after U.S. regulators had insisted the aircraft was safe. We're going to be issuing an emergency order of prohibition to ground all flights of the 737 MAX 8 and the 737 MAX 9 and planes associated with that line. I've spoken to Elaine Chow, Secretary of Transportation, Dan Elwell, Acting Administrator of the FAA, and to Dennis Mullenberg, CEO of Boeing, 
and they'll be available shortly after our conference today. And they are all in agreement with the action. Women have rallied in the Yemeni capital of Sana'a to condemn the latest airstrikes on Hajab province, which killed 22 people. The group of women protested against the killing of 12 children and 10, 10 women in attacks by the Saudi-led coalition on Tuesday. More than 30 people were also injured in the bombing. Yemen has been facing the world's worst humanitarian crisis since the war began in 2015. Thousands have been killed and more than 2 million people have fled the country. Yemeni women came out today to express their anger and to condemn the heinous crime committed by the coalition forces against the women in the Kushar district of Haja province. These crimes are not to be the first and will not to be the last by those who have imposed silence with international complicity. The Africa Now Summit has come to an end in the Ugandan capital, Kampala. This year's conference focused on harnessing the skills of African youth to secure the future of the continent. It sought to find African solutions to problems and to develop partnerships. During the summit, leaders called for greater integration to resolve the conflict. The whole concept of integration, the whole program of uh, uh, economic blocks and putting ourselves together, does not become a subjective matter to one or two, three leaders who maybe have challenges here and there. Mm. And therefore it is important for us to have solid institutions as a region where we can have predictability, that it doesn't matter who is elected tomorrow. British MPs have chosen to reject a no-deal Brexit in any scenario. The so-called Spellman Amendment was passed by 312 votes to 308. It essentially means the UK rejects leaving the European Union without a deal in any circumstance. They are still to vote on the government's substantive motion, which originally only rejected leaving without a deal on March 29th. On Thursday, the House of Commons is set to vote on a possible delay to Brexit. The eyes to the right, 312. The nose to the left, 308. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Unlock. The wife and children of an Indonesian terror suspect have died in a suicide bombing at their home. Following a standoff with authorities, the wife self-detonated. It happened after police arrested the husband, who is a member of the Islamic State-linked terror network. The group is blamed for a number of suicide bombings last year. Four women prisoners in Italy have turned designers in the city of Venice. Anna, Maja, Mihaela, and Sin are inmates in the Goidecha prison. Their work was showcased at the launch of an ethical fashion brand called About Our Workers. The dresses are inspired by the Burano lace maker's outfit, the traditional outfit of the worker woman in the Venetian region. Chile is preparing to submit an application to UNESCO for what could be its first natural heritage site, the Madre de Dios Archipelago. Its strong winds and almost constant rain have created a unique landscape on the archipelago, which is made up of, of, up, of, up of 54 islands. The area is currently inhabited, but it has remains from the Cahuescar culture, which inhabited the island 6,000 years ago. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesurenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.